Hey, welcome today. We've uh, we've got a, an awesome guy that uh, I had the blessings to get to know here last summer, playing some golf with him. And man, I said this guy's got to be a ditch digger story. And and, and actually, I, I dug into him and asked him, you know, bugged him on the golf course, took away from his his uh, focus, I'm sure, many times as I asked him, "How the hell did you do this, Brian? How did you build this company and then this company? Now you're on this one, right? How are you doing all this stuff, right? As a young guy that you are." And so, you know, Brian probably was frustrated by the end of the round, but uh, I had fun. I got a lot out of it. Not at all. Sure. Not at all. And, and sure enough, by then, like, this guy is an all-star. So, Brian, welcome to Ditch Digger CEO, buddy. Thank you, Gary. It's nice to be with you. You got uh, myself and Robbie. Robbie's my buddy and works with us. He's a leader in our team at Raybine, and, and uh, you know, he's a younger – a younger entrepreneur, and uh, I like getting some some youth, uh, the, the the mindset of, of a youthful guy like Robbie to throw questions at you that might be different than, than mine, right? Sure. So we have a lot of fun with that, and Robbie in the end will, will, will take away some nuggets of, of what he what he picked up as success uh, principles and stuff. So, uh, you know, we always like to start uh, with, you know, really, Brian, you know, where, where'd you grow up? You know, how, how'd you, how were you raised? And, uh, you know, who, how'd you become the guy you are today? You know, your family, uh, youth yeah. sports, what did you do? Yeah, so, I, you know, <clears throat> I was born and raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, both my parents had attended the university. Uh, my dad uh, grew up in Ann Arbor, you know, from like five or six years old onward. And my mom's from a small town in Michigan called Charlotte near the capital, Lansing. And so I think my upbringing was sort of a solid middle-class background where we really had the blessing of being in a college town with a lot of diversity of thought and, and a pretty, um, a, a pretty cosmopolitan group of people owing to the university of Michigan and going, going to school at a public schools that were very close to the university. And my parents were hardworking, you know, well-raised, just ups, upright citizens. And I think tried really hard to sort of create an environment where my brother and I could, could pursue activities and schoolwork and have fun, but not be, um, you know, not be too troubled with the world's, you know, problems. And so I think it was like, you know, I, I, I often, I sort of, wish there was an easier way for me to live in a college town. Uh, what I like to do from a business perspective, being an entrepreneur and, and now, you know, sponsoring entrepreneurs, you kind of got to live in a bigger city. But, um, I, you know, I have very fond memories of growing up in Michigan. And then I, I went to Princeton for college and uh, the weather was like 10 degrees better all year round. Then I moved to San Francisco after college and, it, I went the first two years living in that city without ever wearing a jacket in the city. And I thought, man, Ann Arbor, where I grew up, it's kind of a crappy place to live. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know what you don't know when, you know when you're just born and raised somewhere. But I do remember walking to school in the winter and my hair would freeze. It was so cold. And I was fairly vain as like a fifth grader. So I would like style my hair with water and then it would freeze. And then you know, you'd get to school and it'd be like 85 degrees in the classroom. Then you'd be too hot. And I, I have like funny memories of being a, a youth in Michigan, but uh, how's, how's that for a start on background? I like it. I like it. So did it, did it your, your hair then iced up? And then did you sit in that 85 degree classroom like with, it, with your hair melting then or what? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I think that the 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 key point there is I I, I was qu quite excited about things like fashion and hairstyles when I was even you know only seven or eight years old, and so in a way I think it's kind of cool that I ended up you know really my first entrepreneurial journey was one that frankly involves designing clothing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it, it took me a long time to get there, Gary. You know, I went to I went to Princeton for college, and while I was there, I studied economics and finance, and I really kind of got on that pre-professional track. And then I started my career at Bain and Company as a consultant, and I loved the company and I loved the people, but I didn't really like the job. I should have been in sales. I should have been carrying a bag somewhere, but. It was an elite job that paid well. And, you know, from there, a lot of my colleagues moved into private equity. And so I did the same thing. So I did two years at Bain. Um, 
I did two years at a private equity firm based in San Francisco and Boston. And while I was working in Boston, I had a girlfriend who gave me a sewing machine. And it was kind of a joke and kind of not. Um, she was a very talented seamstress. She had gone to fashion um, and design school in LA and was working at Talbot's in Boston doing um, visual design. And she and her sister lived together and they had their own sewing machine to, to make yeah. things. And she brought it over for me to use one day and I started making my own trousers in my apartment in Boston. And I like to joke, I think I was the only, at the time I was 26, I think I was the only private equity associate <laughs> who was like working, you know, in a state street office in, in near Faneuil Hall in Boston, who would come home after a long day at work at eight o'clock and turn on a sewing machine, you know? Wow, <laughs> it's like, that's, that's so, cool. I, I think what, I think it's a great example of like how I'm, how I'm just maybe a little different than your average guy who was working in finance at the time. Like I, I was sort of, looking for a way out of that world to do something more creative and to do something entrepreneurial. And so I feel very fortunate that this idea to start a, a trousers company came to me and, and that there were some really supportive people in my life, including at the time, a girlfriend who had some, some sewing skills and could kind of help, help me start moving up the curve of learning how to learning how to actually make my own clothing. So that became the start of Bonobos. So, okay, hold on. So what, 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 your, what type of clothes were you making for yourself? Were these denims? Were these nice pants no, and just suits? Trousers. Or so I, here's what I would do. It's pretty hard to make a pair of pants from scratch unless you have very specialized equipment. But what I would do is I would buy a pair of pants that was like a little bit too big for me, turn it inside out, take it apart, and then redo the seams and the hem and basically um, I could take apart the waistband and put that back together as well. And so between controlling the waistband and the, and the inseams and outseams and the hem, you basically could style a pair of pants. And so I was remaking trousers into the fit that I preferred and discovered some things about how, how pants were generally made that I thought could be done better. And that was sort of one of the, the beginnings of, of sort of the, the design ethos behind Bonobos. So, so I, I'm picturing this. So you're, you're this, uh, you know, this young, this young uh, private equities guy in a, in a cool world of private equities. Most people are pretty excited about that. And then, and then you know, they're, they're all partying at night, having a good time as they're building their, their reputation there. You instead are going home. I can envision you in, in, and in your underwear, then throwing, this, throwing these things on, taking them off. I mean, is that kind of the way it, it, it was or yeah. what? I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I would say this. I, I, feel, I feel like when I was working in finance, I'll tell you one other story, Gary, that's sort of related. When I worked in consulting um, at Bain and Company, I, I would come home and, and refinish furniture in my garage. And I just really was looking for an outlet to do something that didn't involve staring at a screen. And I didn't really know what I was doing. It was sort of like with the sewing of my trousers, you know, it, it, it's not like I was some virtuoso like Amadeus Mozart, who has this unbelievable precocious talent. It was more, I just liked working with my hands. I liked sanding wood and painting things and having a reason to go to the hardware store and buy paint and make stuff. It just felt really good and I, I'm sure that there are young people out there working various jobs where they spend a lot of time at a desk or a computer um, and I'm sure some of the businesses you've built you know you've got a bunch of super talented people that get to be outside they get to do projects they get to kind of do things the right way work with heavy equipment create create and design and it's just like I realized then and there that I probably wasn't destined to sit behind a desk all day sure. yeah and, and I, you know I, I talk about that a lot as far as uh, you know so many people that work in my business that can, you know many of them knew that they liked you know skilled labor and they are you know they'd like to be in the trades and all that and and others didn't know that or didn't really realize that that was, was going to turn them on and they went to college and now they're doing stuff 
you know, in the concrete world, asphalt world, and roofing world, whatever, who, who have, you know, four-year degrees, some of them MBAs, right? And they go back to this world that we're in. And, and it'd be cool if there's a way that, to figure that out a lot better to where people are, 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 uh, are, are more charged and excited to be in, in the skilled world if possible. And then, and then uh, and I guess the combination of that and the entrepreneurial mind that you have is, is, is really, um, I think, an amazing blessing because if you're skilled and you love working with your hands and then you can understand you know, uh, you know, the, the entrepreneurial vision of, of scaling and duplicating and, and all that, uh, it's amazing where it can go, right? And we have so many yes. people in our business, smart, smart as can be, they just love working with their hands. And yeah. they, could work, they could work in an office all day long, right? No. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, I think we probably in this country send way too many young people to a traditional four year university. I think there's probably a much better way to educate maybe half of those students. I mean, look, if you're the one who who's getting a very well rounded liberal arts education, and then pursuing a career in law or in medicine. I get it, you know, I, I think like sure. school is a huge part of that. And I think, you know, the components of it that are a well-rounded liberal arts education, I think it's a, it's, it's a real gift, but we, you know, one of my best friends is the number one real estate agent in the state of Wisconsin. He's probably one of the most intelligent guys I've ever met. He's very well read. He's an unbelievable writer. He didn't go to college. And, and there's just so many other ways to educate yourself and, and develop skills. And I, I mean, I think he's the smart one, right? I mean, he, he didn't need to waste four years going to school. He started working right away. And as a result, he's been incredibly successful and doesn't have the financial burden of having spent a ton of money on college. Now, it's not to say it's not right for some people. I just think we, we probably ought to have more apprenticeships, more ability to travel, more ability to try different jobs and kind of figure out what is right for you before you go and spend all that money and all that time, you know, who knows? I mean, 100%. You know, we, yeah, we know that we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% of our college students don't graduate, right? Don't get a degree, right? So we know that there's a big chunk of those that should never have gone, right? That there's probably something for them that was better for their yeah. life. And, and then, of course, then you have the, of the, of the six, 60% that's left over. So many of those don't use that college education. I don't know what the number of that is, but I'm guessing it's, you know, 40, 30, 40% of those don't use that education for the career they go into, right? So uh, it's got to be some better way to, to vet that, I would think. But I'm not sure our, our society wants that, you know? Yeah. I, and w one final thought there, you know, w with respect to, so I also have a two year formal MBA, right? I went to Stanford business school and while I was there, I learned so much and I was exposed to so many wonderful people. One of those people was my, my eventual business partner, Andy Dunn, who, who's co-founder of Bonobos. And you know, we've had our ups and downs in our partnership and in life, but I'm, I'm quite confident that had I not been his roommate and had he not been my best friend in business school, I wouldn't have had the courage to take the risk to go start a company. Sure. And so I think another big question for, let's say you're 17 or you're 20 and you're thinking about what you want to be and where you want to go. It's not just the, the more formal mentors that you're able to, to secure, you know, like the guy who's 25 years older than you, who's a fit, you know, you know, your dad's friend or mom's friend, who's awesome at building businesses and is nice enough to spend time with you. It's, it's also like, who are your peers? Who are the people in high school you chose to hang out with and what were they interested in and how did they, sure. and I would say in college, I was really influenced by a bunch of people who have ended up in pretty traditional finance type jobs. And in, um, in my time after college, I was exposed to a lot more creative type people through things like Burning Man or other events I attended or, you know, DJs I got to know by going to see them play music or artists and I you know I think it's really it's important to just be intentional about who you spend time with right and and who you let influence you and I probably wasn't very good at that in middle school and high school I probably wasn't very thoughtful about it um you know truthfully even at Princeton when I was surrounded by a lot of really bright people and a lot of wonderful academics 
I, I wasn't very successful at finding and securing mentorship in a way that I think I got a lot better at as I just grew older and wiser. Mm -hmm. and, um, sure. That's another area where I just think, you know, for me, I was, I think, a late bloomer on some of these maturity components, but also just, you know, these programs. And I went to, I went to a very well-regarded university, but I didn't really have a strong uh, relationship with anyone at the leadership level at that school. You know, it's kind of interesting. Hmm. Might have been a good thing. You might have become a professor. <laughs> I don't think I've got the, the brains for that, but... Okay, so so when so when we talk about you know you, you're you're sewing your own pants and you're and, and then you figure how did you figure out that there was a market there? How did you figure out that there was something that you that you could be passionate about? Yeah. And 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 how did that start? Well, so here's what happened. I I finally got some. I got like super serious about doing this my second year at business school, and part of the risk was just starting to spend money to actually make a product and kind of figuring out how to do that. It's pretty daunting. I mean, it doesn't seem, it's hard to remember just how daunting it was at the time. But, um, you know, I probably spent $50,000 across the pattern making and the grading and buying fabric and buying zippers and making labels and doing all these things just to kind of get going. And I sold the first 500 pairs of pants out of the trunk of my car and, you know, shipping them to friends. And I think, I think when, what I like to say is I knew I had something when people I didn't know were buying another pair, right? When they were like repeat customers who, you know, it's like, if your mom buys something, you know, <laughs> you're, you're probably not sure you have product market fit, but mm -hmm. um, establishing that product market fit um, pretty quickly, I think gave me the courage to invest more of my own capital. And I also think it, it influenced Andy, my business partner, to, to get involved, right? I think he had to kind of see it and then he saw it happening and thought, you know, there's something there. And, um, you know, even after I started the business, I sometimes like to joke, you know, uh, how important Andy was to the story. I often will joke, like if it weren't for Andy, I probably would still be selling 10 pairs of pants a day out of the trunk of my car. And I'd probably have like, a serious finance job during the week and I'd do it as a hobby and I'd still be doing mm -hmm. it. So, you know, at some point you got to go out and kind of swing for the fences a little bit. And for us, that meant raising some outside capital and, and really trying to build a company, not just have it be like a hobby. And what, what are the strengths that, that you saw in Andy and then he saw in you and, and how did you got, how was, how did your strengths differentiate to create, you know, you know the, the structure of the business to begin with that became successful? Yeah, I mean, the truth is much, much has been said and written over the years about our partnership not working that well. And so, um, including a case at Stanford Business School that we both go back and participate in where they talk about, you know, why this founder, founder partnership ended in divorce. I think what I would tell you is both of us had a lot to learn about actually running a company. And building a business and we made a lot of mistakes. Um, I would say the things that were really positive were we were both pretty courageous guys that were willing to take a lot of risk and, and take the leap of trying to go build a brand from scratch. And neither one of us really had that much relevant experience, which I ultimately think might've been helpful. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, first and foremost, I think to be an entrepreneur, you just have to be willing to take that risk. You have to be willing to put yourself out there to start something, to hold yourself accountable. And, you know, it's very, very different than punching the clock at someone else's, someone else's company. And I think, mm -hmm. I think Andy was a very courageous classmate of mine who really influenced me to be more bold and brave myself. Um, I also think it's really helpful when you have some friends around you that say, Hey, this is a good idea. Like you should go do this. And ideally there are people who are customers. So, you know, if you, um, I, I've often, I've often sort of daydreamed about becoming a general contractor cause I love real estate and I like building things. And, um, you know, I, I've, I, like part of me thinks, well, I should just go build a house and sell it and see how it feels and then figure out if I want to do 50 more of them, you know? And it's like, 
How do you right. get the courage to take that risk, right? How do, like, what, what makes you buy your first property and, and hire an architect and, and buy all these materials and start building and know that you might lose some money? Like, what, how do you get that courage? And I think, I think people find it in different places. Um, and I think for me, it was largely around just really having this dream of making a brand that I thought was cool and sort of filled a hole in the market. And so largely it was driven by not seeing that market demand be met and also delighting in seeing customers that were really excited about it. So when, when you're, when you're young like that and you're jumping in a business that, you know, it's kind of good not to know what you don't know. Right. I mean, yeah. if you really know, if you really knew back then what you didn't know, you may not have done what you did. Right. And so, I mean, I, I feel from my, my experience, that was my experience. Right? I probably wouldn't have gotten started in the business I was in if I, if I really didn't know what I didn't know. Right. So for me, I, 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 there's a lot, a lot of trouble ahead that I, that I didn't see. Right. But we, and getting through it, even with at the loss of, of, you know, financial losses, the lessons learned made me stronger. Right. So continue, tell me about your, you know, some of the lessons you learned that you didn't know were coming. Right. Yeah. I mean, gosh, Gary, there's so many, but you know, I think, I think just to paraphrase a little bit, like what you're saying and what I think, and I'll try to come up with a few specific examples, but really, um, you know, there is this incredibly liberating feeling that I experienced becoming like a founder of a company and and realizing like it was my score sheet, right? It was like, so I, I spend a fair amount of time um, watching college sports. I'm from Michigan, you know, we, we're not very good right now at football. We do have a great basketball program. And I often think about how frustrating it is on a Saturday to watch your team lose when you have nothing to do with the outcome. And how different that is than like Monday, Monday through Friday when I'm like working for myself and have total control over the outcome or at least a huge amount of control over the outcome. And I think for me, there's a framework there, which is just in life, I think the sooner you are responsible for your own outcomes, the better. And the sooner you take responsibility for those, the better. And the sooner you realize that like, no amount of handouts or hands up or anything else is going to have anywhere. Like what you really need is for people to believe in you and to have an opportunity to build something. And if you do that, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to hit some bumps in the road. And so I think for me, the, the obvious one was when Andy and my partnership really, really struggled. You know, we, we just didn't really know how to be business partners. We both worked at very, comfortable high-end jobs that you only get if you go to top schools and work really hard and are good at tests and everything else but they're homogeneous environments and they, and and they're very pres it's very prescribed it's show up people tell you what to do here's your computer here's your desk it's a beautiful office you've got a nice business card we're going to pay you really well and you're surrounded by supportive thoughtful nice people who all want you to succeed that's pretty far that's pretty far from like being a ditch digger right? Yeah, or it's like, absolutely. Here, here's your, and, and I think what I found was like, I, I just, I like people who work hard every day for what they have. I identified with them and I wanted to feel like one of them. And, and I think having real, like, you know, so Andy and I, in the early days, we made the first, call it 10 plus thousand pairs of bonobos. We made them in the garment district in New York City. And I remember in 2008, we were paying ourselves like 70 grand a year. So among our classmates from Stanford Business School, we were probably the two lowest paid people uh, that graduated out of like 400. So, you know, we had the, we had the lowest cash compensation. We, we owned part of a company that what really wasn't worth anything. Um, our first investment was raised at a $3 million pre-money valuation. We raised 750 grand at 3 million pre. So it was a very low valuation by today's standards. And we, I, I remember carrying fabric from a jobber's office to a cut and sew shop in, in July. It's like 105 degrees. And I feel like a very Bush League version of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he's carrying those big tree trunks around in, in, um, in uh, 
in commando. And it's like, yeah, I'm like sweating through my clothes. I've got this big roll of fabric on my shoulder and I just feel like I'm so tough and I'm, you know, going up four flights of stairs in a factory filled with, <laughs> you know, um, you know, potentially, you know, um, not legal residents of this country who don't speak English, who are, you know, it's, it's slaving away making products. And I mean, look, uh, you know, it's not like we were working with sweatshops. We, you know, we paid people fairly, but like at the end of the day, it's not a very glamorous thing being right. in production in the middle of the garment district in New York. And um, I learned a lot of lessons, but I actually really liked it. I liked it better than putting on a suit and showing up at a consulting firm and feeling a little bit like an imposter because I was, you know, in my 20s being paid a lot to give advice to Fortune 500 companies who, frankly, what was I doing doing that? How did I end up in that job? So huh. well, that's, that's amazing, though, that you, you had the courage to jump out of that when, you know, when there's big money like that and in, in, a, in a great opportunity. It's hard. Like that. It's hard how to you, walk away. How do you leave? It's yeah. hard to walk away. And I think people end up trapped by the lifestyle they live. I mean, the one thing I'd say, Gary, is like universal advice I give 20 some 20 something year old kids who are working in their first few jobs save as much money as you can so that you have the flexibility to try something different, right? Like I didn't, I didn't come out of college. You know, my life savings at the time was probably like 5,000 bucks or something. And so, you know, I had to start somewhere. So I found a job, I worked hard and I saved a lot of money. I never had my own apartment. I always lived with roommates. I didn't drive fancy cars. I drove crappy used cars and like, mm -hmm. I took public transportation. I cooked a lot at home. Like I, I, I had saved a, quite a bit of dough by the time I got to business school and I used that money to start a company. And like, that's, that's why you save not to buy a fancy car, like to change your life, right. To have the flexibility to go become a self-made person. And look, I had a lot of help. My parents paid for college. Like I feel very fortunate. I, it wasn't like I came from some amazing, you know, incredibly underprivileged background. But I had to work. I used my own money to start my first company. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I think that's a really important part of my life story and who I am, you know, something that absolutely, no one will ever take away. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that, you know, the, the ability, to, the understanding of how to make money, the dignity, the, the dignity to work and the, to, to be able to, you know, to, to be able to know the money in your pocket was something you worked hard for is a really good feeling. And, and if you, if you, you know, you kind of get addicted to that, you know, you don't want anything from anybody else. You want, you want to earn it yourself. And it's, and it's so much more fun and, and gratifying when, when you are ready to, to invest in that business or someday buy that car, um, you know, that, that, that you can pay cash for. And it's, and it's, and it's uh, you know, it, it, it feels good because you know, you, you worked hard to pay for whatever that is. And yeah. so I think that's a great lesson to give any kids, right? If you can afford an education for your kids, that's amazing. That's awesome. Right. And, and beyond that, you know, gosh, if you can get your kids to support themselves and, and, and create their own uh, job or business, small business on their own to do something that support themselves, it's a, it's a great lesson because they'll, they'll feel better about anything they buy with their own money compared to what you're buying for them, right? I think that's right. And I think it's true across all levels of society that people derive an enormous amount of their dignity from the ability to have a job and to work and to be needed and to find meaning in that. And I think what I would say is I, I would never badmouth the professional services jobs that I had. There, there was a, a lot of dignity and pride I, I got from those, but I wasn't as fulfilled as I was creating a product and selling it to customers and just having like a little bit more of that like small business, part of a supply chain, part of a part of a little market and then having customers, right? Like yeah. Having people you actually serve can be really fun. I can be fun because if you do a great job, they want you and they, they recommend you to their friends. And that's another thing that I think can drive a lot of esteem for entrepreneurs. It's just being, being well-respected and being, you know, having repeat customers, right? Like, like, I mean, it's great. Yeah. I mean, having, having people love your product is the coolest thing in the world, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, for us, for us, it was, uh, you know, facilities, products and pavements and all that. But for you, it's clothing, which is really cool. And, and to know that people have a smile on their face and they put your clothes on. Holy cow. That's, that's really cool. Right. And, and, and to still continue on that trek is, is amazing for, in what you're doing. 
you t tell us where that went and how long it took before you, um, you know, you kind of bowed out of that business or whatever. Right? Well, so yeah, so Bonobos, Bonobos had a pretty strong early rise. We were able to raise more capital from people who believed in a much larger outcome was possible for the business. But after about two, two and a half years of working together, Andy and I had, um, a conversation where we basically just agreed that it wouldn't make sense for us to continue as business partners. And he was very thoughtful about it and calm. And I, I, I think I also was pretty calm about it. It was upsetting, but it wasn't like, it's sort of like a good breakup where, you, you know, a woman tells a man or vice versa, like, Hey, I just, I'm not in love with you anymore. Or, or a man tells a man, whatever, whatever the relationship is. Yeah. Right. But it, it, it's like a, okay, you can kick and scream, but eh, they look you in the eye and they tell you that it's probably time to move on, you know? And so what are you going to do? Where are you going to go from there? And so that was 2009. And I very quickly um, moved on um, from New York to Chicago to launch Trunk Club in Chicago. And that became my next entrepreneurial endeavor. And it was hard, Gary. It was hard to walk away from something that I'd started and, and been an early, a big part of the early story and, and know that I was no longer going to have any control over the outcome. But it was also liberating. It was sort of like, okay, I, that was my first try. And there were a lot of things I didn't do well. And I learned and now I get to kind of start over. And, um, you know, it's kind of the same way. I think I've had, I've had some friends recently go through a divorce. And I think the ones who've been successful in that difficult life journey are the ones who've said, look, this thing didn't work out, but, but I, you know, I've, I'm going to make the most of what's in front of me and I'm going to adapt to my new world. And I get to keep trying, you know, I get to get back out there and, and try again at relationships mm -hmm. or, you know, finding the next version. And I think, I think optimism is such a critical part of addressing entrepreneurship and, and it's sort of a, I'm going to do my best. It might work out. If it doesn't, I'm going to be okay. I'll find something else. I'm always willing to work hard. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to starve. And uh, so, you know, I, 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 had, I feel very fortunate to have been able to get right back on my feet and try again and to have some investors who believed in me and I was to support that endeavor. So that, and then optimism, in my opinion, produces that you know, grit and perseverance that and, and as, as an entrepreneur, you better have some of that or a lot of that, right? Because if, if you don't, boy, you, you get knocked down really bad and you might not get back up and you'll go back to the, a regular job or wherever it might be. And that's okay, right? But man, the best entrepreneurs I know have, have gotten knocked down many times and, they, and they're so optimistic and they're so positive that, that they're, they're, they, they become really gritty with, with great perseverance and, and you can't stop them, right? I can tell you so many friends of mine that have got knocked down many times in their life and man, they keep going and, 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 they, and eventually they, you know, they can look back and say, I was successful, whether it's at, at a level financially they wanted or, uh, you know, to build, to build the, the employment that they wanted, whatever it is, right? So perseverance and, and grit are big and, and with optimism, it can happen. If you're, if you're pessimistic, man, it's a tough, it's a tough road, right? Yeah. And I think, um, I think people, you know, if they feel stuck in their career or they feel like they're in the wrong field, um, you know, you've, you've got to put, you've got to take some risk to make a change in life. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and I think it's an important lesson to learn. Um, I also think Gary, like I, I think for me, it's, I didn't become an entrepreneur until I was like 29 or 30. And mm -hmm. my path to get there, you know, was, was like work really hard in school, get good grades, play sports, you know, follow the rules, um, get a great job, show up on time, work hard, try to get promoted. Like, I, I think that's an okay way to spend 10 years. I, a friend once told me he, he joined a very well-regarded private equity firm and the founder said to him, you got to get old somewhere, kid. And I think the point was like, <laughs> you, got, you know, when you're 24, you, you know, it's, it's harder to just go out and start a business or be an entrepreneur. So there's also, I think, some, some upside to just like spending a part of your life for your working life, showing up at a job and just doing a good job and, and finding role models, right? Absolutely. Finding And, and um, it's very satisfying to, to do a good job as a junior person. And I think for me, some of the folks I worked for along the way I was inspired by and others not as much. And I think you take, you take positive and, and you take positive lessons from some people and you kind of say, oh, I, I don't really want to be like 
that person and here's why. And um, a lot of it's idiosyncratic to your own little world or your own preferences. But for me, um, when I sense that young people have an entrepreneurial zeal, I, I often tell them like, you know, don't be afraid to take a risk, but you don't have to do it tomorrow, right? Like there may be some upside to staying in the job you're in for a period of time to get more skills or to make more connections. You know, Andy and I, two of our very first investors that committed to uh, Bonobos were professors at the business school, lecturers at Stanford. And they only committed because of the impressions that we had made on them in the classroom mm -hmm. as guys that had pretty interesting ideas and, and you know, obviously we'd made some sort of favorable impression or at least one of us had probably Andy. Absolutely. And, no, that's, and so that's like, cool. You know, you never know if the things you're, you know, whether it's the, the people you're working for, what I've often experienced is that old bosses make the best investors because they've actually seen you on the job, do what you say you're going to do, show up, work hard. And that's often where I would look first if you needed some outside capital to get a get an idea off the ground. And they're probably going to have the guts to call you out, right? And when other people might not, if they've only worked for you, right? If somebody like that, if they, they know you, they they know enough about you, they can call, they, they understand your 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 blind spots probably, which is amazingly yeah. uh, you know advantageous if you're if you're a leader that that warrant, that allows that to happen, right? Allows people around you to challenge you like you you hopefully would an old boss. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you became an entrepreneur earlier in your life and career than I did, and I and I think I, what I would point out is like both can work, right? The right time to go into a totally risky venture, it might be twenty, it might be twenty-five, it might be thirty, but the more that you work hard and save and make good impressions on people along the way, the the more optionality you'll have to eventually do that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think as you know, the earlier you start, the more lessons you're probably going to have to learn, the more, the more lumps you're going to probably take. If you haven't been around business, like for me, you know, it was a lot of lessons because I, I barely made through high school, right. Let alone go to college um, where, you know, at least you were around business, you, were, you went to business school. So you hopefully, I think you started with at a point where you kind of got it. You understood business, you understand a little bit of raising capital, some of the things that most people wouldn't if they started at 20 or 18, like I did. So uh, it, you know, there's, there's advantages to both, but hey, if you look at everything as a lesson and, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, expensive lesson or inexpensive lesson as you make yeah. mistakes, I think you know, things will work out. How about, how about okay, so when you, when you did, did, when you got bought out, did you keep some stock in, in Bonobos when, at that point or did you, did I did. you just say yeah. you're done and move on? No, I did. There, 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 was, no, there was no money to buy me out um, because we were using the capital from investors to build the company. Um, a funny thing happened, not funny, but it, uh, what, what transpired ultimately was a, about a year after I left, there was very strong investor interest in the company and Andy wanted to bring in two different, um, very well regarded venture capital firms in order to do that. It, it actually helped facilitate for me to sell some of my stock and, um, that formed the basis for, um, my ability to make a few investments in other startups. And that was uh, something I was excited to do. And it was nice to take some risk off the table and, and diversify my, my holdings. Um, and, and through that, I, I learned that I really, really liked backing other entrepreneurs and investing in them and being an informal advisor. And even though I didn't know that much about entrepreneurship at the time, I, I was in the trenches, you know, running a business on the front lines and growing a business. So I enjoyed having some other friends and, you know, supporting other founders. And, you know, that's primarily what I did with the money that I took off the table at that stage. And then, of course, I maintained some ownership all the way through Bonobos ultimately sold to Walmart in 2017. So, you know, that was seven years later. Okay, so when, then you you soon after started Trunk Club, right? How how long after you start Trunk Club? Trunk Club after you left then, and uh, I mean that really wasn't a competitor, right? To, to no, it or? wasn't. It wasn't a competitor, and it's a complicated story um, of how it all got started. But suffice to say, I really only had about a month a month and change in between leaving Bonobos and jumping in with Trunk Club in Chicago, and you know Bonobos the story was like 
men's trousers are not very flattering. Uh, we had this term khaki diaper butt where like, you know, guys wearing, guys wearing dockers and just kind of looking like schlubs. And, uh, and that was part of what we solved with Bonobos with a curved waistband and a more flattering type of fabric and a better cut. That was really the innovation. But the other innovation that we had was avoiding the traditional wholesale channel and just selling the product direct to consumers. It, it, it doesn't seem all that novel right now, but in 2006 and seven, there weren't a lot of places to go online to buy pants. And there certainly weren't a lot of brands that only existed on the internet selling things like pants and shirts at the time. You know, the most of the retail apparel market, most of the apparel market was still done, you know, in brick and mortar stores. Trunk Club's innovation was slightly different. Trunk Club was, was a very early participant in what, what I'll call the assisted commerce. And the basic gist of Trunk Club was guys hate shopping, but love to look good. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, whether it's because they didn't have access to shopping or they didn't enjoy it or they didn't really know what they were doing, the bottom line is we thought assisting them in that process would would be a pretty interesting sort of new market to build out. And ultimately, the core service proposition was just, we're going to send you a box of clothes that are going to be awesome. And you're going to keep what you like and send back what you don't. If you happen to live near us in Chicago, come into our office and we'll do all that in person with a beer in hand. And it'll feel like a very different experience than going to Macy's, right? Mm -hmm. And so they weren't really directly competitive. In fact, for much of the time when I was running Trunk Club, Bonobos was one of our vendors. We sold, we sold Bonobos trousers to our customers in a wholesale arrangement uh, with Bonobos. And, you know, the Trunk Club story, uh, you know, it was a really fun business. We, we built a great team. We were able to raise several rounds of venture capital and we launched the business in late 2009. We were acquired by Nordstrom in July of 2014. And the entire growth of that business took four and a half years and we sold the company for $350 million. So clearly there was awesome. a lot of perceived value there. And um, along the way, we hired a ton of people. Um, at the time we sold, we had a lot of our employees, our team members had equity in the company and, and did really well. And then we became part of the Nordstrom organization and had a lot of fun in the next chapter. How so. fun was that, right? To see, to see all these people that you love rewarded, right? All these people around you that helped you build this thing to, to be rewarded at that point, right? That's, that's really cool. Yeah, we, you know, we, we worked really hard on having a culture that was welcoming to people who had charisma and wanted to work hard. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we weren't, we weren't super focused on where'd you go to school or where did you work before this? We were really focused on, do you want to sell clothes? Do you want to delight? our customers and do you want to be part of a hard charging startup based in Chicago? And we built a great team and had a lot of fun and have, a, you know, we really couldn't have done it without the thousands of wonderful customers that we had. And guys really loved the company. They fell in love with the brand. They love shopping with us. We had a, we had so many customers that were, you know, lifetime spend over $10,000 with trunk club. I mean, I like to think that we were really making the whole process, the whole, the whole idea of like helping a guy, feel better about the way he looks mm -hmm. is something that I care a lot about. Um, I'm less interested in like runway fashion. I'm, I'm very interested in the self-esteem and the brio and, and courage that comes from just feeling better about yourself and taking care of yourself. And your clothing is an important part of that story. And you know, how you get that clothing is a, is a pretty important part of the whole equation. And so we, we would joke with our team. It's not like we're rocket scientists here, you know, putting a man on the moon or, you know, um, doing open heart surgery and saving lives. Like it, it's, it's certainly not the most serious and, you know, life saving mission critical job on earth, but it's important. And it, and it was fun and uh, it was artistic and creative. And I, uh, and I think it was, it was, um, it helped kind of uh, invigorate an industry and disrupt disrupt some of the traditional players who frankly hadn't been doing a great job for their customers. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, for, for sure. I mean, guys don't think about, you know, about looking perfect in clothes very often, right? I know I don't. And, I, and I, 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 I'm far from being the greatest dresser in the world. 
But when I get a suit that's fit for me or you know, clothes are fit for me, I definitely feel a little more confident, right? So if you think about the little more confidence that, that might uh, overcome a person that, that's fit with your, with your clothes, right? What, what could the result be, right? Who knows? He you know, finds a better spouse, a better girlfriend, uh, you know, um, gets a better job, right? Whatever it is, right? That little bit of confidence yeah. that's gained in that, it could be life-changing, which you, know, you don't really think about, but it's, I, I'm confident that's the case. So that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. I, I, and I just, I think uh, there's a, a level of self-esteem and pride that comes with taking care of yourself. And I think the clothes you put on are part of that signal you send to the world. So for me, it's less around, it's not, it's not so much around designer labels or trends or fads. It's more around just things that fit well and, and, and help you fit in and, and, and help you not necessarily so much stand out, but feel good about yourself and end up kind of putting your best foot forward in life. So yes, was there anybody else that, that discovered that niche before you? Yeah, I mean, because I'm I'm I, I'm confident that you know that that that's been done with women's clothing and women you know women's uh, fashion for a long time, right? And and for men, boy, I just never really heard of it until you guys came along. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, what happened with guys guys hated shopping. They didn't like going to the mall. They didn't like going to, uh, you know, a Macy's or a men's warehouse. They didn't, the environment wasn't friendly to them. It wasn't comfortable. It didn't feel like something they looked forward to. And so they didn't get good at it, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't, they, and, and I think it's like having a great accountant or having a great massage therapist or having a great um, pilot or having a great um, buddy that you play uh, tennis with like it's like having a real accomplice and mm -hmm. and our job as stylists at trunk club was to make you look awesome and a lot of people just didn't have someone really helping with them helping them with that before and sure. then they'd, they'd pay more attention to it they would care more about it and they would invest more in thinking about you know how it's kind of fun it's fun to have a nice wardrobe it's a nice it's a nice treat you know it's mm -hmm. a it's a it's a was often part of a reward mechanism I think people treated themselves to if they worked hard and had success. Sure. What, now, where did, uh, since you guys sold, how has Trunk Club changed in any way? Or, you know, what's the difference today from what well, they were? So we, you know? it's been seven years, almost six and a half years since Nordstrom bought the company. And, you know, I think they would, I think Nordstrom's a public company and their stock is, um, is quite a bit lower today than it was um, six years ago. And I think that that reflects, frankly, that um, one, you know, during this pandemic, uh, traditional department stores have been really affected because they haven't been able to carry out business as usual. Stores have been closed, et cetera. Two, um, that market is really dynamic and it's, it's adjusting quickly. And I think in some ways, Trunk Club has helped Nordstrom be ready for the next chapter of, of retailing at a, at a very high level. Um, and, you know, in others, I think there's technology that, they, that, the, that we developed that they've been using and using um, also as a template for some of their newer stores that have smaller square footages. But uh, it's a competitive space, and it's been a hard space. And I think, um, in general, I think there's still... Uh, let's just say the jury's still out on on who the long term winners are going to be in 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 apparel and retail. It's a tough space. It's really hard to stay on top. Absolutely. And and when you think about um, you know the, the the lessons you learned right at, at uh, Bonobo's Trunk Club and 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 that you use today. Now I know you're you're doing some awesome stuff. You love you love mentoring young entrepreneurs and investing in some of these entrepreneurs and all that. You know, what, tell us about some of the stuff you see that, that really, really gets you excited and turns you on when it comes yeah. to somebody yeah. that really is, is somebody you want to invest in, right? Somebody you want to, yeah. you want to put some money behind, right? I'll give you a great example. So uh, I, I got pitched with an opportunity to invest in um, a footwear company that was being built with healthcare workers in mind. The company's called Clove. The website is goclove, C-L-O-V-E, G-O-C-L-O-V-E.com. And the founder is this incredible, incredibly charismatic young guy, Joe Ammon, whose wife is a nurse. And he observed that they, there really wasn't a great footwear product out there for the day-to-day -day needs of her job. Wow. And he 
he said, honey, I'm going to make a better shoe for people like you. And so designed this um, shoe. You know, nurses have historically worn clogs or running shoes. And neither one of them is the exact right. It's sort of like a decent outcome, but not an optimal outcome. So Joe designed a shoe that's really comfortable to stand up in your be you know on your feet all day as many nurses are, that's easy to wipe down if it gets um, you know fluid or, or contaminated in some way. So it's basically like um, a, a, a repel, water repellent, non-absorbent. One of the challenges with the running shoe, for example, is if it gets blood on it, it's very hard to yeah. Yeah. And one of the challenges with these clogs is they're not that comfortable and they kind of look silly. I mean, it's like, you know, Dutch tulip shoes kind of thing. Like, <laughs> so, so Joe, Joe came to me with this idea and I had been introduced through a friend here in Austin who I'm now partnered with as an investor and I, I'm, I've joined his firm and I just thought, this guy is awesome. This is a great idea. He, he was a second year in business school and, and didn't have the money to start the company on his own. And so um, a bunch of investors, myself included, stepped up and put money in and have watched him build this really awesome brand that makes shoes for, for healthcare workers. And I just think like, that's really cool. You know, three years ago, that product didn't exist. Two years ago, he had this idea. A year ago, he launched the business. Actually, like so, no, almost exactly a year ago. Like their first full month was December of 2019, and now he's got tens of thousands of customers who love this product and who who like he solved a problem for them. And I just get really excited about founders who are solving a real problem and uh and and are solving a problem for uh, a group of people or uh, you know type of person um personally i i don't get to i don't get to invest in in um biotech it's not really a space i know that much about but i've been fascinated about reading about how different research and, and investment in early stage companies put us in a position to develop a vaccine so quickly for covid and i think that's solving a real problem those companies are providing a huge service to the world and so again you know i'm making cowboy boots or shoes for nurses like I'm probably not solving the world's most pressing problems, but like, it's fun. Uh, the founder of the Cowboy Boot Business, Tobis, I'm, I'm a company and I'm an early investor, led the first few rounds of financing for the company. He just came to me in Dallas one day in my office in 2015 and said, I think the world needs better cowboy boots that can be bought directly on the internet. And I said, that's a great idea. I'll invest. And you know, today we've got a great company here in Austin. We employ hundreds of people. We've got a huge uh, network of factories in Leon, Mexico that produce our product. And we've got hundreds of, we have 400 and some thousand active customers today like, buying our boots. Like that brand didn't exist five years ago. I mean, that's, that's really fun. So, okay. So I, I had the great experience of uh, golfing with you at my club one day. And uh, I got a, I got a pair of boots from you, man. It was the coolest gift I ever got. And uh, you know, from, from somebody I just, I'm going to golf with. Right. And uh, I, I still got to ask you, why did Bo Jackson get two pairs and I only got one? Well, Bo what's Jackson it, played. played <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Bo Jackson played two sports at a very high level, and uh, I, I paved. I paved two different types of pavements at a really high level: concrete I, and asphalt. I, I, I have no <laughs> doubt that when it comes to um, asphalt and asphalt derivatives, you are king. I but, too. Um, I was I was nervous that Bo um, is so fierce, so fast, and so strong that he would wear through the first pair quickly, even though they're very well made boots. And I didn't want I didn't want that to happen. So oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, he. he uh, I tell you what. So since since you give me, the, I bought boots at uh, Cowboy Christmas a couple times now, and I would wear those once in a while. And I, I went back to the rodeo in, in Dallas uh, recently, and uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, and I wore my boots. And everybody, I, every cowboy I'd see, or you know, some famous cowboys that uh, that my buddy is sponsors and stuff, I'd say, hey, let me see your boots. I said, check out my boots, and and they'd say, whoa, those are nice. I said, oh, these are real nice. I I bought boots around here. I said, these are the best. These are, these are a buddy of mine's company, Tacoma. These are the best. And they said, oh, wow, Tacoma. Cool. Yeah, I know about those. Those are really yeah. good boots, right? So yeah. the cowboy, the cowboys know your boots, dude, and they and they also think they're awesome. So that's that's that means a lot. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's fun. 
it's fun to be a small part of that story. You know, our founder and CEO, Paul Hedrick, deserves, you know, all the credit for creating that brand. But in order for a young guy like that to get off the ground, some people that have capital need to take a risk and need to bet on him. And so mm -hmm. I'm always, pretty, you know, even if I'm just one of 10 people doing it or 15 investors, I'm excited to help these people. You know, it kind of feels like it's, um, you know, when you've been fortunate and you've been successful as an entrepreneur, I, I don't think it's uncommon to want to believe in other people to do it and kind of put your money where your mouth is. So 100%. It's, it's the most fun, isn't it? I mean, I'm blessed to, to have 11 companies that people run for, for us and, and that, that I believe in. And we, and we want them to be the best entrepreneurs they can be serving, serving better than anybody else in the world and the product they're going to serve. Right. And then, and then I have fun, a lot of fun investing in other businesses too. Some I'm on the boards of some not, but it's a lot of fun when you see somebody that's passionate about a product and they know they're, they know they're serving a market maybe better than anybody else who they think they are, or they think they can. And then, and then hopefully, hopefully give them a little bit of shared experiences that can help them on their way. And, and if you can find other investors to help to, to fund, it's a, just a great, great, uh, great thing to be a part of. Right. And, yeah. and, and some, some don't work out, some are going to crash and burn, but, uh, hopefully the lessons learned in, the, in that crash and burn are, 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 are great enough lessons that person goes on again and do something better. Uh, but often when, when, they, when they're successful, it, 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 just, uh, it just gives you so much uh, excitement uh, for entrepreneurship and, and, and you, you continue to you continue again, kind of like our golf game, right? I mean, you hit a, you hit a great shot one in three or four times, it might keep you coming back or heck, I, I hit one, one, in, one in 18 holes and it keeps you coming back to golf, right? Um, you, by the way, you son of a gun, you hardly even play the game. You play like you've been playing, uh, you, you, like you play every day. I, know, am that, that, not a, I am not a good golfer, Gary. You don't, dude, need, to, dude, you don't need to pretend. That's, wait, wait, that's how bad I am because I, you're, you're way better. And, uh, and it's that, it, it's that, it's that uh, fact, the fact that you played hockey uh, in high school. Do you play in college too or just, just high no, school? No, I, I, I didn't. I wasn't that good. But I, I, I do think hockey, hockey players tend to transfer to golf better than other sports like basketball. It's an unfair. It's an unfair advantage, especially you know, as a wrestler and football player. And those sports definitely don't don't translate to uh, to golf at all. But uh, either, either way, way, what do you think? What do you think would happen if we put Bo Jackson on hockey skates? Well, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to get in his way. That's for sure. I, you I know, think he could have been the greatest hockey player of all time <laughs> if he played that sport. <laughs> You might be right. You might be right. He's only, he's only the greatest of the things he's tried, okay? So you, I, you might I, be right. I'm not sure he would have been the greatest player of all time, but I'm virtually positive he might have had the hardest slap shot of all time. <laughs> You're right. How about that swing is, right? He definitely could break a stick over his head or his knee. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It'd be like uh, 10 times easier than the bats he broke, right? But, totally. Uh, so anyway, uh, no, all fun stuff. But, you know, so, so again, when you look at – you look for uh, – entrepreneurs you know, a few, few I, more I look things. for people who are solving problems and who are really mm -hmm. authentic there's nothing more fun for me i'll give you an example we um our firm just backed a company um called grace based in san francisco and the women who founded it are trying to solve the problem of what happens when you're a busy professional and you have a parent that is going through end of life stages so yeah. Yeah. nursing homes hospice um you know potentially even uh more acute health care challenges and you're trying to help manage those challenges somebody has remotely right so you know my parents live in ann arbor michigan and san francisco i'm based in austin texas during the school year in chicago in the summer i'm nowhere near where they are what happens when they need help and i need so coordinating that care for them and creating an app you can use on your phone in relationships with different um, service providers and making it all seamless and, and offering great customer service. Like yeah. that's a, that's a really important service that doesn't exist. And um, one of the women who found it, it spent like nine years at Aetna, one of the largest health plans. So it has very firsthand experience to how are the payers trying to, attack these challenges and how where where are the where are the gaps in care or services and what products need to get built that just don't exist that's really cool i mean and, and another even better example you know i spent a bunch of years living in dallas when we were running trunk club and there's like very few taxi cabs in dallas well all of a sudden this company lyft and this company uber come along and you can just pull out your phone and get picked up in two <laughs> minutes like 
it's it's a total game changer and it prevents people from not being able to go to a doctor's appointment or not be or, or, or from driving while intoxicated and like mm -hmm. th these companies are just solving real problems and I, I don't want to lionize all the entrepreneurs or, or think that it's like you know the most amazing sensational thing but it's it's pretty fun to be part of making the economy better making the world better and backing founders who've witnessed firsthand like this could be better i should go build the better version and having the courage to do that and i think that's what makes our economy in this country probably the most vibrant one in the world and uh you know makes our country home to many of the world's most important and innovative companies is like that spirit and so you know i, I love being part of that and, and now that i'm on the other side of a couple successful exits it's a real privilege to be able to distribute capital to people that you see that potential in. Absolutely. Now that, that company that, uh, that, that woman started, are, are you an investor in that? Yeah, we, we just invested in, in the, the sort of the first meaningful amount of outside capital that went in. So um, let me know more on that on the, on the side note. Uh, there are two things. Number one, it'd be fun to be part of that if there's ever another opportunity. But number two, I've got an amazing friend of mine, one of my very good friends that's also a Ditch Digger CEO um, who started Bright Star. Bright Star um, is a leader now in that space in the space of in-home senior care or you know yeah. end of end of life care and all that. Yeah. And and her her um, and she she took care of my wife in her la in her last you know they took care of our my wife in her last eleven months of her life and 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 uh, they're amazing they're just amazing Bright Star is an amazing company but her goal was to to create in-home um, care health care um, that would compare to the Ritz Carlton type of service for just a little bit more than the normal what you normally pay right so it's a few bucks more an hour let's say but these people are amazing i mean they 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 really find people with the right core values and they uh they do amazing stuff I and mean, they're if you're, you get dirty dishes they're they're not going to be dirty in an hour if they're hanging around right if they're if, if they if they have access to them and, and, and you're, yeah and just think person. just think like you needed that service you were able to afford it and it was a godsend right that existed absolutely and, and absolutely. i think I think that's the spirit of entrepreneurship that I get the most excited about is like solving real problems for real people. And that's the, I think that's probably, that's uh, some of the advice I dispense when I'm addressing groups of young people who want to kind of become entrepreneurs and are, are curious about how do you, like, how did you end up there? And like, now you've done this and you've been successful, but you know, one day you were sitting in the seat as a 12th grader at Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor or as a, you know as a first year mba student and like you know you, you hadn't done anything entrepreneurial in your life like how, how do i get there and one thing i tell people is like make a list of things about the world that bother you that you could change or make better right and, and serve, serve the world yeah 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 i mean and like I, it's funny um think about like chick-fil-a right i mean who knew we needed a better fast food chicken restaurant? And I'm not personally like a big customer of the brand, but I greatly admire how popular they are and how much joy they bring people, right? And, Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, you know, right now, Kentucky Fried Chicken is also having like a, 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 a wonderful run as a big provider of mm -hmm. home cooked feeling meals during a pandemic right at a very reasonable price point and I'm, i happen to be a big fan of kfc i like the product and i'm like you know that that's just a cool product you, you got chick-fil-a you got kfc they're both competing they're offering you know then you got taco bell innovating with their menu and you've got sonic who's got like the best ads and the best concretes and they like i just i, I, yeah. I think the spirit of businesses competing competing to delight customers is like it makes the world such a better place. So playing even just a small role in that, I think is a really fun, a really fun thing to do. And entrepreneurship and supporting it gives you the ability to do that. Well, if that, if that business you talked about a minute ago um, from that, that woman needs a board member, like I said, Shelly, you got, you'd have to talk to Shelly. Shelly is an amazing person that understands the industry inside and out and might be somebody that either, either yeah. a mentor, a mentor for So, but uh, I mean, but that, but that's really bit. So what we find is, you know, is, is entrepreneurs that are great entrepreneurs, they don't go in at saying, you know, I want to be, I want to be really rich, right? I mean, yeah, they want success, right? But, but they go into it super passionate about what they're doing. Like you did sewing those pants, making less money than you would have made otherwise if you stuck with what you're doing, right? But you're so passionate about serving other people 
and, and you and you're so excited about seeing people you know loving your 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 products your your the raving the raving fans that you created got you more excited to serve even more and better right and yeah. and again, I'm I'm so confident that that's what makes that's what's made America so strong compared to the rest of the world. We've we've allowed that to happen with this free enterprise system that we're blessed to yeah. be, be living with, right? Yeah. Um, well, just, and Gary, you know, one thing I will say, you, you talk about like your role models and people that you look up to. A lot of the people that I had the most respect for as a child were teachers. Right. Mm -hmm. And sure. they, they had a huge impact on my life. Our soccer coach, Bill Browning, my soccer coach, Chris Morgan, both of whom were lifelong educators. Um, you know, uh, I can just name off, you know, uh, high school teachers, Mr. Pollock, Mrs. Houston, like yeah. Alan Loeb, like people that had a huge impact on my life. And they were all teachers because those are the impressive adults you're exposed to as a young person, teachers and coaches, right? And if you think about it, neither one of those jobs is particularly highly compensated with cash, but I think they were some of the most inspiring and frankly satisfied people I knew. And, uh, you know, both of my parents, my mom was a social worker, my dad was an attorney. Uh, neither one of them was especially focused on material things or outcomes. Um, I was probably more focused on that and I, I don't feel bad about it. I just happened to think cars were cool when I was a kid, mm -hmm. right? I, yeah, I, 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 watched, I watched Miami Vice. I thought it was an amazing <laughs> show. I loved the music. I loved the way it made me feel, even though I was only nine years old. So I wanted the, a Ferrari. Like, did, the met, did the members only jackets uh, turn you on too or what? I love members only jackets. <laughs> I loved brands like Genera and Gerbode. I mean, I, I, and I cared about my clothes and I liked it. And, you know, it's funny, I think in hindsight, you know, I think my mom may be worried that I was like, you know, too focused on materialism or, or brands or whatever. And it, maybe now that I've had a career in the space, it's fair to just say like, that's what I was naturally gravitating toward was the artistic component of it, the, the expression component of it. And, um, you know, there's ways to channel that into, into a career. And if you can, I think it's, it's awesome. But back to the point, you know, who inspires you and what do they care? What do you care about? I mean, I think the single greatest reward of success as an entrepreneur is the way you get to treat your employees and the way you get to inspire people and the way that you can play a really important pr role of provider. And frankly, I think, you know, in a, in a world that's politically, you know, very unstable and, and really unfortunately like pretty broken. I think Washington's pretty broken on both sides right now. There's a lot of, I think a lot of the best leadership in this company is happening at the corporate level, at the university level. I think Mitch Daniels at Purdue is one of the best leaders and best writers. Mitch is all, he's awesome. He's awesome. He's a world-class guy. And I think there's, I think there's world-class people on both sides of the aisle. You know, Mitt, Mitt Romney comes to mind. I, I had a ton of respect for John McCain. Um, you know, the, the, there are great people doing great things. And I think a lot of them are in business. I think some of our strongest leaders today are people like Jamie Dimon, not you know, the senators and, and representatives who can't seem to get along to, to pass a stimulus package. Yeah. And, and, and back to, back to your thoughts and my thoughts, when I think of leadership and government and business, whatever, again, it's those people that are out to serve others before themselves. And, and I, and I'm in the government is the same thing. When I, when I look at, you know, people in government or people in business, those that are focused on serving, you know, serving the market they're supposed to serve, right. At, at any cost to be, to be the best is, is the most impressive to me. And, and, you know, some of the names you mentioned are those, are those names I think about, right. I mean, um, you know, when, when people are, are doing it at no benefit to, to themselves and very often, you know, foregoing a salary or benefits or pension, whatever, because they maybe can afford to, right? To to serve a market or serve a, a, a government or whatever. It's, it's, to me, those those are leaders, right? So Very honorable. Like, it can yeah, be. And, so, yeah. and it can, and, and again, whether it's business politics or whether it's education, and, and the same thing. My, my some of my, my my coolest mentors are those that had confidence in, in me, in high school sports, and in in, in in classes I was struggling in, right? To say, Gary, you, you, you can handle this. Let me, let me let me help you. I know you can get this done, and you can you can get an A in this in this next test if you just study these things, right? Or the coaches that said, Gary, I, I got confidence in you. I'm going to make you the captain of this team or that team. And 
and the, the, those, the, those, the confidence those teachers and coaches instill in you, I mean, carry you through your life, right? You never forget that stuff. So yeah, you're right. Teachers, I mean, they're unsung heroes so often, aren't they? Yeah. I agree. So, so uh, Robbie, what do you got here? I mean, this guy is, uh, as I as I told you, man, is an amazing guy that uh, I, I want to be uh, friends with the rest of my life because uh, he inspires me just just uh, just hanging out with him. Um, tell me about what you, what's your thoughts here, Robbie? What's going through your head when you're listening to this this, this awesome dude? Yeah, I actually think it was a, a pretty perfect segue. Um, one of the questions that I had down uh, actually came from a few friends that. I reached out to, and I knew we had this conversation today that uh, actually worked at Trunk Club uh, for a few years uh, from um, about like 2015 to 2018, I, I think is when they were there. And their feedback was just how incredible of a human and leader and uh, more specifically how inspirational you were uh, as a visionary for the company. So obviously through this conversation, I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to to listen to you and, and learn from some of your past experiences. Uh, and it's very clear to me how well-spoken you are. And, and I think oftentimes one of the, the most difficult, uh, at least my perception of it, uh, most difficult ways to uh, build a business is to make sure that as you're growing and scaling, you're always iterating and improving uh, the message and how you're inspiring your team. Uh, so I guess I'm just curious to understand when you're five employees to 50 to 100 to 500, uh, what you're thinking about when it comes to a framework for inspiring your team? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good question. And, and Robbie, thanks for the kind words. Um, uh, it means a lot to hear positive things about your tenure as somebody's, um, you know, chief supporter. I, I, I would say I, I learned a lot about, about sort of inspiring people and, and um, trying to uh, kind of rally the troops from fellow founders who I spent time with or had conversations with. And, you know, some of the wisdom that was distilled is, I'll, I'll share one, I guess it's a framework maybe, or just an idea, but, you know, people, you can't motivate people. They have to be motivated, they have to motivate themselves, but you can inspire them. And I think what we tried really hard to do was to place the value and the quality of our work into the context of what we were trying to achieve. And so, you know, in these all hands meetings that we had every month that, that I think could at their best be very inspirational, you know, it started out with, hey, we're 15 people and or we're 10 people or we're six people. And I would just say something nice about everybody around the table. Like, hey, Deborah did this. Uh, John, it was amazing when you took care of this customer. Or here's some really positive feedback for Kevin or for Steven or, you know, Michael, our first salesperson, like had an unbelievable sale with a customer who loved him. And then as you get bigger, it's hard to single out individuals and sort of make everyone feel great, but you still would find ways to, um, to praise people. And I just think in general, um, the, the more positive and the more you can call out the good that people are creating, the more inspiring it is to be in a company like that. And, and so what I, what I would say is like, at first it's like, Hey, like this is what we're trying to do. And all these great things you guys are doing are helping us move toward our journey. Then you get some proof points. Hey, we were able to raise capital. Uh, great news. This investment firm who's very highly regarded put a million dollars into Trunk Club. Or great news. We hit, we hit our um, biggest month ever in November. We set a sales record. Or, great news. We have some promotions to announce. And one of my favorite things to do in team meetings was to announce promotions and make a pretty big deal out of it. And as part of that, to read positive things about the person who is getting promoted that their teammates had said about them. And over time, those, those powerful, you know, you know, Kevin is one of the hardest working, nicest uh, bosses I've ever had. He cares about me. He does an awesome job. He's thoughtful. He's just an incredible person to be inspired by. Okay. Well, like I would read that when Kevin was getting promoted to VP of finance and, 
your team ends up sort of creating the narrative of what the culture is in the way they talk about your best teammates. And very few times would anyone say any of those nice things about me. It, like it, that wasn't the point, right? I, there was no promotion. I was, I was sort of stuck as like the founder and CEO and like that was the job and you get paid well, but it's, it's lonely. Right. And, and they, it, 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 there, no one's kind of coming along and like saying, Oh, our boss is so great. So great. Like you kind of hope down the road, five, 10 years later, people look back and remember the experience as one they grew from and were inspired by, but you're watching your team grow and develop right around you. And your teammates are the ones that ultimately promote each other by highlighting who their, their highest performing teammates are. And so I think that was a really big part of what was inspiring is just the level of positivity and frankly that, that it was it was it was deserved and we we were able to largely avoid it feeling very political you know we kind of it wasn't a gossipy political kind of place despite having a lot of young people that that got in and out of jams and, and trouble here and there or stayed out <laughs> too late occasionally or you know maybe did something they shouldn't have done and you know you heard about it and you you laughed about it, but then you just kind of got right back to work. And uh, there was a lot of really earnest hard work. And I think if you're lucky enough to assemble a team like that, and I felt really fortunate that the, you know, the two large offices for Trump Club were, were Chicago first, and then we opened a pretty big office in Dallas. And I think both places have a pretty rich tradition of people just kind of being humble and having Midwestern values and, and busting their butts to you know, to support whatever they're working on. And that was, it was just really fun to be part of something like that. I'll tell you, at the end of the day, I think it's no secret that there were, there were some, you know, it was a pretty big financial outcome for, for the leadership team. But the, the, real, the real reward was just being part of that, you know, being part of a championship caliber team and, and getting to feel like, no matter whatever, I mean, like, look, you can make a lot of money or you can lose it all. Like at the end of the day, like, I think what drives your success is the impact you have on people in life. I, we used to joke and I, I still to this day say, I like, measure my success by the thickness of the stacks of thank you notes I receive from people that I have helped along the way and helped along the journey. And today as an investor, you know, I really hope that I'm able to get good returns for our limited partners, but I feel like the best way to do that is to make a big impact on the lives of these founders. And when you're leading a company, it's to make a big impact on the lives of your teammates. Love it. I love that answer. I can tell you're speaking uh, authentically too, which is uh, even more important, like you're saying, arguably than, than anything else. Uh, so I guess along that same, maybe not the same vein, but curious and let's say that you're at the stage of maybe 250 or 300 employees by this point. Yeah. Uh, just to understand, uh, like your passion obviously was driven by fashion, the industry, how you can solve the customer's problems more effectively, uh, it, as well as ultimately building up that self-esteem, like you're mentioning. So uh, I'm curious, how did you balance your time as you grew to that stage to still yeah. focus on what it was that you were really passionate about and, and, and not, uh, ultimately over indexing on the other side of um, priorities. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then I'll try to segue to a point that I think might be digestible for your audience, which is at the end of the day, I think if you're a successful founder and CEO, you just do whatever needs to get done every day, the best you can. And you, you, try to become just like a fiercely productive human, right? It's like you just wedge as many outcomes and high impact things in as possible. So for me, it's like, hey, I was on a plane to LA on Wednesday to go meet with our team there where we had, you know, ultimately maybe 50 or 70 people. And I had one of our superstar uh, sales directors from the Chicago office had relocated, or a couple of them had relocated to LA. So, okay, I'm checking with them and then I'm on, on the phone with a PR thing in New York. And then I'm taking the two top salespeople out to lunch. And then I have an interview because we're trying to add a, you know, this person to the team. And you just kind of carry that energy to everything you do and try it, it, Like, I think sometimes this is the segue. Like, I think sometimes people 
in the generation coming up right now, uh, you know, a mixture of what is, I think, millennials and Gen Z. I think there's a little bit of a, um, like a mis misnomer that like, you can have all this great work-life balance that like you can do yoga and stand on your head and like live in Vail and have a great job and be super productive and eat avocado toast every day and like have a really healthy stock portfolio, but like never be stressed out. You know, it's like, you can't really do all that, right? Like life is about trade-offs and about compromise. And I think anyone who's been really successful as a leader of a team realizes you got to be the first one out of bed. You've got to be the last. I mean, I think there's no better training ground for this than the military, you know, the true like servant leadership, right? Like, lead, you know, leave no soldier on the battle battlefield and, and like take care of your people and you're the last one to get food and you're the first one to take the blame and you're the one who's got to make the hardest decisions. And I think over time, if you enjoy leadership, you just figure out how to do all those things and kind of make the most of it. And I, and I, I, I don't believe I'm coaching a bunch of founders right now who are really successful. I'm super blessed that a bunch of the larger investments I've made where I'm on the board, the founders are doing very well and their teams are growing rapidly. And sometimes they'll say like, I'd like to do more of what I think I'm really good at. And sometimes what I'll say is like, you, you got to do it all. And if you're not that great at it or you don't love it, you either learn to like it or force yourself to, it's like eating your lima beans or your spinach or your broccoli. It's like, you just got to do it, you know? And, and just cause you know, the, the biggest miss, the biggest, I think misconception of, of being a founder is that you do it because you don't want to have a boss. I think, I, or, or you don't want to have to do anything you don't want to do, or you want to make your own hours. I think it's much more, the people I've seen be really successful at it are, they want to change the world. They want to have a huge impact. And if you want to do that, you've got to work really hard and you got to do some unsavory, unenjoyable things, whether that's breaking down boxes or taking out the trash or, you know, getting down on your knees and putting a shoelace and a pair of shoes for a customer. Like you, you've got to work hard. And I think what I tried to role model was like, it's all pretty damn fun. It's part of a, it. Like what we're doing is cool and it's interesting and we should be proud of that. And so I'm going to just make the most of it and be positive. And I think that is the leadership by example and role model that I was trying to set. I didn't always get it right. There are days where you just, were exhausted and couldn't get anything right and the wrong words came out or you fell flat or you tried to give a team meeting. but hopefully in those moments your teammates kind of filled in around you and stepped up to support you um and then, you know in terms of like the brass tacks robbie like at the end of the day when you're leading a big team you become a bit of an actor who's just telling the same inspiring story over and over again to different groups of your team and i think you're rewarded for consistency and passion Love it. Love the simple uh, two bullet points there. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Well, also, also, you know, you, you do go into business sometimes as, as an entrepreneur saying, I don't want to work for somebody, but then you realize, you know, whether it be the next day or the next 10 years that you're working for a lot of people, right? Yeah, a you, thousand you customers, right? Or every, whatever. Every, and every employee. I mean, if, if you're not working hard for those teammates, right, then you're really not much of a leader. If you think they're, they're serving you, you're not much of a leader. You better serve them and you better, and you better understand that every customer is your boss, right? And, and so, yeah, I think that that's short-lived when you, when you do go off and many people do go off to start a business because they don't want to work for somebody, but end up realizing, man, you're working for a lot of people, right? And that's uh, that was a that was a great point that you made, and and uh, I, I like that. You know, also, uh, you know, you got to do it all, as you said. I mean, I I I like math and stuff, so the accounting eventually became, you know, understanding profits became fairly easy for me. But I sure didn't understand labor law that I had to learn. I, yeah. I, I and I didn't I didn't really understand, um, you know, um, you know, basically loaning money or finance or anything like that, right? But but you know, so you, you got to, as you said, you got to do it all. You can't you can't think that as a leader of a business, you can just, this is what I'm good at. Other people are going to do these other things. Well, you don't learn enough about those other things. You're going to have a hard time leading people that are handling those other things. Right. So, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. A and great I think, point. you know, there's no doubt that, you know, great CEOs end up hiring really strong functional leaders of different sure. divisions, whether it's finance or accounting or sales or uh, you know, uh, uh, supply chain, but 
at the end of the day, um, if you lose interest in the core business or in leading the team and, and growing, you know, you're not the right person to lead the company anymore. Uh, you don't have to be the best. In fact, I think, I think there were, there was really almost nothing that I was the best at at trunk club. I was just kind of the hub that pulled a bunch of different great people together and made sure they were happy and supported and that there was enough money to pay them and, and a business model that ultimately kind of was going to work in the end or, or had so much promise that people were willing to continue to invest in it because the, the prize was perceived to be very important in some way. 100%. One other point, Gary, about like working for people, working for customers. I think when it doesn't feel like work is when what you're doing for customers is something that you love being great at. So what I would tell you is at Trump Club, you know, our very, the very best expression of what we did is a guy came in at four o'clock after work, cracked a beer, sat down on a comfortable couch, and I would say to him, I'm just going to make you look awesome. Are you okay with that? You don't have to buy anything. <laughs> we're going to start with these dark jeans, then we're going to put on an awesome pair of boots, and then we're going to put on a great white dress shirt that fits perfectly, and then we're going to do blazers, and then sweaters, and then coats. And if they, if they got into it and they were just like, yeah, this is awesome. I didn't really care if they bought half the stuff or one thing. I, Cause you never know what someone's budget mm -hmm. is. And you, you, you never know what their values are on what they're willing to spend. But if you could take them out of the drudgery of their day to day and, and dress them up in, let's just call it a costume of looking great, looking sexy, looking strong, looking, more flattering. One of the one of the most important secrets of Trunk Club is if you're a little overweight, a vest makes you look really good. The vest is the fat man's sweater. And when you put the right guy in an awesome vest, he just looks good. You're like, ah, you look tough. You look strong. You know, like it just, it, it's about knowing like when someone walks in with a certain body type, what you can do to, to make the most of that body type. And like, my point is my very best people were all really excited about the act of doing that, about sure. the process, about the brands, about the act of making people look awesome. And then the transaction is secondary. It's like, okay, yeah, you're going to buy some stuff. Great. But like, wasn't it fun that we just spent 90 minutes like playing dress up and like the yeah. truth is like, I'm not afraid to say that. I love it. I think it's super fun. You know, oh, that's, and, that's really cool. And okay, if so you can do that with a grown man, who's a serious person during the day and he can take himself out of that seriousness and take some risk. And my favorite is like, Oh, I'll never wear that. And then like 30 minutes later, they buy, buy it, it. <laughs> and, and, and 30 days later, they're like, you know, you're right. I wear it. It's my favorite thing in my closet. That's cool. Like, Great. And you know, when someone would sit down after, if they'd come in as a customer and they were coming back and they'd been a big customer, one thing I always like to say to them was, is there anything you bought from us that you don't like or you're not wearing? And most of the time they would say, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. They probably didn't think they would bring that up with me, the CEO, but I asked them, they'd say, yeah, actually there is this one shirt. I just haven't worn it. I'm like, bring it back. I don't care if you've washed it. I don't care if it has a tag on that's it. All, that's we'll amazing. Re we'll replace it. And the key point there was, we're not just trying to get you to buy shit. We, we yeah, want yeah, yeah. you to be satisfied. And that's, that's fun. If you can, if you can empower your employees to be able to deliver that make level of customer to, service yeah, yeah. and make them happy and your business model works, then that's a, that is awesome. That yeah, your is like when, yeah, when, when you can make, when you can allow your, your employees to, to really um, manage that customer experience, right. And, and be totally accountable for a great experience above and beyond profit. That's cool. Right. It's that's way more fun. Cool. It's way yeah, more yeah. fun. So, okay. So give me, give me a hint on this now. Okay. You know, I'm a, I'm a skinny, you know, skinny uh, old white guy with a, you know, gray coming in everywhere and all that with blue eyes. What do I, what do I, you know, what colors do I go after, dude? I mean, uh, red looks pretty bad on me. Uh, what? Yeah. What you looks... shouldn't wear red. Most guys don't look good in red unless they have darker skin or a great tan yeah. or, or, you know, like sort of like the handsome Latin man can pull off red, yep, right? Like yeah. the, sort of like the Ricky, the Ricky, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ricky Martin. Ricky, like, Ricky Martin. Yeah, yeah. Ricky Martin can wear anything. So can Derek Jeter, right? But um, exactly. You know, I will say this: as you age, the more dressed up you get, the better you look. 
Um, mm. I don't recommend to 70 year old guys that they walk around in t-shirts or ill fitting golf shirts. Um, put on a nice um, sweater, a layered look, um, wear clothes that fit your figure. So when you're slim, and I know you're a slim, very fit guy, it's important that your pants are not too baggy. It's important that the sleeves of your blazers are tailored so that they don't, they're not blousey. And I think, you know, the, the greatest expression of, of a handsome man is he's, you know, you and I are both, we have the gray coming in on our chins. We have, like, it's a tuxedo, right? It's a, it's a black tie with a beautiful white shirt and a, and a simple, elegant look. And I think, um, I mean, look, there's a lot of different looks you can pull off. I do think uh, when, when you are young at heart, you should feel free to wear whatever you want. But I do think it's a little risky to be very fashion forward as you age. So sure. I think sure. that sort of the elegant, understated, but very nice fabrics that they fit you well are kind of the rules to live by. I love it. I love it. So I got, I got a couple of helpful hints there. I appreciate that, dude. Thank you. And, uh, you know, so, hey, Robbie, what'd you get out of this, man? What are the nuggets you're taking away from here that, uh, that, that other, other entrepreneurs, young and old, are going to say, whoa, I like that. that. You know, Brian had a great point with this or that. Tell me about it, Robbie. Yeah, of course. So I have five today. Uh, the first one, actually, so prior to joining the Rabine Group or Site Technologies and then the Rabine Group, I, I worked at LinkedIn for uh, four years. And while I was working there, uh, I worked in the sales department. And Mike Gamson was the leader of the sales department. I noticed on LinkedIn that you were connected with him. Uh, but one, one of the, the first takeaways that I have is something that he talked consistently about, uh, which is taking intelligent risks. Uh, and the way that he defines intelligent risks is, uh, really trying to quantify what the upside versus the downside of an indecision is uh, in trying to maximize or at least have a, a minimum threshold of a 3x upside to that uh, decision to make a transition in your career or life, maybe it's even a relationship. Uh, and so I really liked what you had said at the beginning in terms of looking into mentors and peers for direction. Um, I, I think that there's it most commonly you'll see that uh, it it's really always just steered towards the, the mentorship base. But I like that you added peers onto that too. I, I think that you can learn a lot from anyone uh, in conversation. And, and so it's, we, should, we shouldn't take that with a grain of salt. I think it's important to listen to everybody's perspective and, and ultimately absorb that. Yeah, side note, Mike Gamson was on the board of Trunk Club. So um, one of my mentors and someone I learned a ton from who's just an, you talk about somebody who is a selfless supporter of entrepreneurship who's done extremely well financially, but I don't think he ever measures himself by that mark. I think he truly believes in just inspiring people to get better outcomes for themselves and taking advantage of his leadership role to challenge people to get more out of their own lives and careers. And I certainly felt that from him. And uh, oh, what, a, what, a, what, a, what an asset to the Chicago ecosystem he, he has been over the years. He is such a beauty, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, that's actually like and, his, and very his good Trump Club right client. Very, very good client yeah. at Trump Club. Big supporter. <laughs> there we go. Now I know where his outfits came during uh, some of those big <laughs> conferences that we had. That's awesome. Uh, so the second point here is uh, perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, and so the, I relate that back to when uh, you were first starting Bonobos. And like you had mentioned, it was uh, really just you stitching together some pants and testing out the market and trying to totally. decide what was out there. So uh, it's worthwhile for you to just ultimately take that leap of faith and, and trust your instinct. Uh, and I think it's the right balance between courage and conviction uh, in order to be successful. The third point is uh, we are all uh, the authors and artists of our own legacy. Uh, and the point that you had brought up that I relate back to that was that we need to take the responsibility for our actions. Uh, and so I think it's really important to own those actions, um, challenge the status quo and accept the fact that mistakes happen. And rather than letting the mistakes drag you down, focus on how you can iterate and improve moving forward. <clears throat> the fourth is more of a practical takeaway, but I, I think it's important for the listeners to ultimately digest is saving money while you're young but it's really the, the product of saving money uh, while you're young that's more important. 
uh, which is just increasing the potential and probability of you pursuing your passions in the long term. Yes. Yes. Uh, so that's the point. The point is not, Hey, you'll have a 401k that's really big. If you just keep doing this job and saving it's, you'll have the freedom to take more risk in life that might lead you down a, a way more interesting life path. Right. You won't yeah, be, the, exactly. you won't be, a, you won't be a slave to an expensive lifestyle at a young age. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love it. I definitely think the product of that decision is, is more important than the actual decision itself. Uh, and, and the last one that I have is um, going back to like how you were thinking about some of those founders that you're working with and mentoring. And, and I trust that you're inspiring at the same time uh, is focusing on the first principles when building a business or trying to, to uh, dissect what the problem areas are and understanding at a fundamental level, um, what are the biggest challenges that, uh, you see in uh, whether that's in the US or even internationally or even just in your personal life on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and then I think as far as like tactically, what the listeners can take away from that is, like you mentioned, make a list of the things that bother you in the world and then start to develop solutions based off of those. Yeah, and, and, and I think that the last one, uh, I mean, they all make sense to me, Robbie, but the last one, the the addendum to that is go after the ones that you can figure out and fail fast cheaply on. Mm -hmm. So it, like I always, it always bothered me when I was living in Austin in 2004 and five, that there were so few direct flights to places I wanted to go. I, I don't like connecting in Houston and Dallas. Starting an airline is probably not the best solution, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, like very capital intensive, take you 10 years. Even when I was leaving, um, trunk club and bonobos i have i've always had this idea of a certain type of hotel that i'd like to build and it just feels like man that's going to take so long and so much money and i just don't have the resources to pull it off so i roll down the list to the next thing right doesn't mean you don't have your running list but also being realistic about which of those things you could actually build a company around you know right. is important is important yeah. no, and, and so a couple a couple of things i i liked as well as you know as leader you know, you really need to become fiercely productive. And I, and I get that. I mean, cause you, you better, you better outwork the people around you. You're just not going to get the respect from them and you're not going to get things done. I mean, as a leader, you got a lot more on your plate that you, you, you can be handling if you're really willing to put the work in. And then last, the other thing, part of that, you know, that you, that you talked about, which I liked is, you know, leadership is, it's, there's kind of a trade off there, right? I mean, you, you, you've got trade offs and in, in, in time with your family and lots of compromises that you better be ready for if you really want to lead. Um, and I, I love that. One of the biggest things I picked up today was really, I got to watch out for that. That uh, would you? I think you called it the Docker diaper butt. Is that what that Becky was? Becky diaper butt. Yeah. <laughs> Docker yeah. diaper. I got to watch out for that because I think I probably get that once in a while. You know, I, I don't have a lot of butt, so I got to make sure that I'm, I'm I'm pulling up my pants. I get the right fit, so I don't get that Docker diaper butt because I I know it's going on sometimes with me. So I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, that, but be very careful for that, Gary. Very careful. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So hey, I'll tell you what, brother, you're awesome. It's really fun having you on. And I, I can't wait to get out playing golf with you again in the, in the near future when the, when the season gets, gets there next year in, in Chicago. But uh, you're, you're a blessing to so many. And, uh, man, keep it up, dude. You're, it's so much fun to know you. Thanks, guys. Uh, it is very kind of you to have me on, and it was really fun chatting with you. Thanks a lot, Thank man. You, and uh, until next time, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, be safe. Until next time on Ditch Digger CEO. See ya. Cheers, guys. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye.